Hello and welcome to Vietnam Television's broadcasting studio in Hanoi. I'm Michael Liu and here are the latest headlines for this hour. New law on issuing secondary legislation documents passed. What new changes have been brought? A new model to help low income earners. How will these help to the fight against poverty? Wang Nam revives mangroves, improving not only the environment but lives of the local people. He tells stories in just a moment. The first of Prime Minister Nguyen Tân Dũng left Hanoi today for the 7th Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam Summit in the 6th Ayayawadi Chao Freya Mekong Economic Corporation Strategy Summit in Nai Pai Tho, Myanmar on June the 22nd to the 23rd. This is in a bid to forge investment and trade ties in the region. The Prime Minister's participation at the event is intended to also seek stronger collaboration with the regional countries in water resource protection and human resources development, raising Vietnam's status and leading role in Mekong cooperation. Vietnam is keen to boost ties with neighboring countries and increase its link with Myanmar as well. We'll give you more updates on his trip in the coming bulletins. Now moving on to some other news. The National Assembly passed a new law on the issue of secondary legislation documents today, June the 22nd. The new law will allow people's committees and councils at district and community levels to continue release secondary legislation documents. However, it will clearly define jurisdictional limitations, formats and procedures for this process. This is in a bid to increase transparency and improve effectiveness of these secondary legislation documents. The National Assembly also discussed matters regarding Vietnam Maritime Code, which will be discussed in our next report. In today's afternoon session, the National Assembly are discussing a new draft of the amended Vietnam Maritime Code. The code consists of laws pertaining to the country's maritime economy, as well as national sovereignty and security issues. What then are the expectations for the new draft code? Let's find out in the following report. Tân Cảng, a food port in Ho Chi Minh City, welcomed the first ships in May. While the funds for the port came partly from local funds, support policies made it possible for private investors to pitch in. Enterprises funded the constructions of 5,000 meters of docks, 300 hectares in container yards, as well as a deep water dock for the Hiệp Phước Industrial Zone. The success of Tân Cảng Hiệp Phước Port has greatly facilitated the businesses within our industrial zone, significantly reducing transportation costs. Opening the doors to such private investment in maritime projects is one of the main points in the amended Vietnam Maritime Code. While experts applaud the initiative, many say the new draft code needs to strictly regulate the participation of the private sector in each project to ensure fair competition. Investment and development of services in a port are basically steps towards monopoly. Therefore, there needs to be policies to ensure economic security if we are to go through with this. Also, as part of the draft amendments to the code, the Ministry of Transport is proposing the development of port authorities, a model applied in many countries. A port authority will be a governmental body or a representative of the government in managing import and export, defense, customs and medical related issues in port areas. With the possible introductions of new amendments to the Vietnam Maritime Code, the Ministry of Transportation has high hopes for Vietnam's maritime economy, setting the target of the sector surpassing the country's oil industry in terms of value by 2021. Vietnam currently has 55 seaports with 219 terminals. However, without a master plan for development, these seaports continue to operate inefficiently. For example, Cai Mep Thị Vai, the largest deep water seaports complex in Vietnam, is currently only operating at 20% of total capacity. Let's learn more about this issue in the following report. 
located in the central region, Cai Mae Thi Phai International Port is the largest and most modern deep water transshipment seaport. However, despite its geographical advantage, the port's managers believe it will need some serious changes in order to successfully operate and attract large-scale containers from international port operators. Cái đích xa hơn. There should be one general operator to connect the whole area of Cai Mep Thị Vai and be in charge of all the terminals in this 1.8 km stretch of coastline. In that way, Cai Mep Thị Vai can become a large-scale transshipment point in the region. Prime Minister Nguyen Tân Dũng recently underlined the importance of increasing the competitiveness of Vietnam seaports, especially by making good use of the Cai Mạc Thị Vải Deep Water Seaport and increasing connectivity among other transshipment points in the central and southern provinces. A master plan will improve efficiency, cut costs and will promote the development of port and logistics services. It is vital now to develop a master plan for development of seaports in the area, including management and financial assistance to increase connectivity among transshipment points. According to experts, thanks to its capacity, geographical location and distances to major regional transport routes, the Cai Mạc Thị Vải port can become an important international transshipment port. To successfully build a large-scale gateway seaport, there should be more cooperation between governmental authorities, management agencies and import-export enterprises. The Viet Build International Exhibition 2015 is currently taking place in the southern metropolis of Ho Chi Minh City. This is a platform to showcase the latest construction materials, technologies and interior and exterior decor products. This year's theme is construction material, real estate and decoration. The exhibition has attracted the participation of more than 800 businesses from 18 nations, including Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, South Korea, Japan and the United States, among others. The organiser of the Ministry of Construction says the event offers a chance for both domestic and foreign enterprises to seek cooperation opportunities, expand investments, study technology and develop products. The ongoing exhibition will conclude today, June the 22nd. The second event of VitBuild will be held in Ho Chi Minh City later this year from September the 1st to the 5th. Also, the Ministry of Construction has requested several localities to reassess social housing projects and submit reports by June the 30th. The reassessment process will collect statistics and updates on the progress of social housing, including recently converted commercial housing developments. The Ministry of Construction wants to ease audit the best of housing for low-income earners, students and workers in industrial zones. The process will go some way to pinpointing existing issues that are currently obstructing progress on social housing policies. The move by the Ministry will hopefully go some way to tailoring the policies to provide better access to social housing. Inclusive business is a profitable and sustainable entrepreneurial initiative that seeks to include the low-income population within the value chain systems of companies. This business trend has been popularized in many regions of the world and has just recently been introduced to Vietnam, showing promising initial results. In this week's edition of Vietnam in Close-Up, let's see how this business model, which is currently being extensively supported by the international organizations here, has impacted local enterprises and the country's large low-income population. Our VT reporter, Ziu Ang, has the story. Quế Phong is a rural district of Nghệ An province and is among the 62 poorest areas in Vietnam. Previously, local people here relied heavily on natural resources and nomadic farming for their livelihoods. Now, however, many poor laborers in the area have started to enjoy a more stable income harvesting passion fruit thanks to the inclusive business initiative of the Nghệ An Foods Company. 
as this business venture has created over 1,800 new jobs for low-income individuals. In 2011, the Danish Government Global Competitiveness Facility Program, or GCA, granted financial and technical support to the project in light of its sustainability, humanity and corporate social responsibility. Growing passion fruits is suitable to us, as we have used to living by field works. The salary is also stable, about 200 US dollars per month. The project has provided employment opportunity for ethnic people here in Kuefong district. Besides, farmers could also receive seedlings, technical assistances, while output is guaranteed. Under the supervision of the GCF, the company built a nursery to grow high-quality passion fruit seedlings in accordance with international standards. These seedlings are then given back to the farmers at affordable prices. After that, the company collects the passion fruit from the farmers at a price of about 0.5 US dollar per kilogram. Aside from bringing them a reliable income, the project has created a satisfying livelihood for poor farmers in the region. The project helps them to be aware about the value of their labor. They can make money on their own land without having to go to the forest for wood. It proves that they can get rich by their efforts. If before, the garden is abandoned, but now, with five to six thousand square meters of passion fruits, they can earn about five thousand to seven thousand US dollars per annum. In tandem with the benefits to the farmers' income levels, the enterprise itself has saved thousands of US dollars as it no longer has to import seedlings from Taiwan. Moreover, the enterprise is able to enjoy an incremental export value of over 7.5 million US dollars per annum by exporting concentrated passion fruit juice to foreign markets like Korea. In this way, by engaging the low-income population in the business value chain, the inclusive business model has proved to be a win-win solution. You can see that the project is a clear example where you include vulnerable population, not for charity, but for business reason. And once these models are succeeding, then a lot more companies will be able to see that they would be able to help the vulnerable people, primarily for their business purposes, but at the same time, the, the vulnerable people and the minority community will also have the benefit of being included in the global economy. Inclusive business is a term that was coined about 10 years ago and has just been adopted in Vietnam through the efforts of international organizations like the Vietnam Business Challenge Fund under the UK Department for International Development. And according to experts, this trend is an optimal development strategy for developing countries like Vietnam as it could harmonize the strengths between different business models. What we propose with inclusive business is something in between. It's a normal business that works with the low-income people for one simple reason. It's not philanthropy, it's not about giving money away. This is about simply addressing a sustainable business opportunity that will benefit not only the low-income people, it's also beneficial for them because the profits that they will make are as competitive as in any other mainstream business, as any other normal business. Despite the remarkable economic achievements that have made Vietnam a middle-income country, the poverty gap and inequality are an increasing and ever more urgent challenge. Many Vietnamese, mostly from rural areas, continue to lack access to markets, income opportunities and basic services. Taking into consideration these factors, in the low-income market now estimated at more than half of the Vietnam population, inclusive business is an approach that can create wealth and sustainable growth, as well as contribute to the eradication of poverty. Zhu Anh from VTV International, Nghệ An Province. Now let's find out how the Vietnam Dong's performing against other foreign currencies offers of today.
Still to come on VTV News, Vietnamese journalists receive awards for 2014, reviewing journey with Vietnam's history. Cyclists embark on Asia tour to save rhinos. How has this effort shown support for the endangered species? More to come in just a moment. First off, the Vietnam Journalists Association celebrated the 90th Vietnam Revolutionary Press Day last night with an award ceremony for the winners of the 9th National Press Contest. State President Chung Tan Sang also attended the event to congratulate Vietnamese journalists on their achievements. President Sang also asked the Vietnamese Revolutionary Press to continue building on this success. Awards were also given in television, radio, print and online media. This year's winners claimed 9A and 26B awards for their works on sovereignty protection and social development. On the occasion of the 90th anniversary of the Vietnam Revolutionary Press Day, Politburo member Tho Hi Rua visited a number of press agencies in the country. Mr. Rua is the secretary of the Party Central Committee and head of the Communist Party of Vietnam Central Committee's Organization Commission. Visiting Vietnam Television, otherwise called VTV, headquarters in Hanoi, the Politburo member stressed the instrumental role that the national network has played in the development of the revolutionary press. The network, he noted, has been a reliable and strong source of information for the party, government and people of Vietnam. On the same day, Mr. Ru visited and congratulated Nyanza newspaper on the success of its first pilot TV broadcast, also on. He shared the hope that the newspaper will continue to adapt advanced technology to produce quality and up-to-date news. Vietnam Aid News Agency also received the Politburo member. Here, Mr. Ru praised the rapid and comprehensive growth of the agency. He added that the agency has and will continue to play a vital role in the press development of the nation. The Politburo member later met with students and teachers at the Vietnam Academy of Journalism and Communication. Here, he highlighted the academy's tradition in training professional and skilled journalists contributing to a modern and flourishing future for Vietnamese press. As a result of the Internet's development, the use of social networks has been increasing quickly in Vietnam. According to a market research firm called Global Web Index, as of January in 2014, 38% of the total population in Vietnam is using social networks. However, social media may have been used to misinform or mislead audiences. Vietnam has stepped up to protect information security on social media. More to follow. Some individuals have used the advantage of social networks to publish and spread false information. Regardless whether these actions were purposeful or accidental, the results have been serious. One year ago, information about Ebola virus breaking out in Vietnam was widespread on every social network, especially Facebook. Due to the viral nature of sharing, the information spread to millions of Facebook users in just a few hours. Two people were forced to correct the information, send apologies to the public and pay fines. Privacy invasion is another type of violation. Individuals created anonymous Facebook accounts filled with pictures, videos and information stolen from other websites or personal pages. This has caused some information to be unreliable. Although the social network platform is virtual, its effect on an audience are so real. So all individuals, especially journalists, need to be more responsible for what they share and write. After ineffective warnings, authorities have planned for stronger measures. Administrative penalties have been implemented. In addition to that, information security on social networks has been considered to be included under the laws on journalism.
The law on journalism will be amended in light of real cases happening recently. Information security should be more protected by a tight legal framework. Social network users will now have to update with the new amendments in mind and take more responsibility for the credibility of the information they share. Two cyclists have embarked on a cycling journey throughout parts of Asia with a mission to raise awareness against rhino poaching. The duo has arrived in Vietnam. Our Vita reporter Fulane got the chance to meet the cycling sisters in a bike tour in Hanoi on Sunday. With these two bikes, Nas and Vicky plan to travel to seven countries within seven months, and Vietnam is among their destinations. The two cyclists are South African sisters of German descent, Victoria and Vanessa Wiesenmeier. The bike tour, starting from Hangza Galleria, attracted the participation of U.S. Ambassador Ted Osis and many cyclists in the city. The bike tour traveled around Huan Kim Lik and the Old Quarter, all for one message. We want to, uh, our priority is to raise awareness about what's happening to the rhinos um, in Africa. So we want the Vietnamese to be aware of the problem and share the message. Cycling through China and Singapore, the sisters have worked with locals to raise public awareness and spark a reduction in demand for rhino horns. In Vietnam, the sisters have joined in Operation Game Change. This is a joint program between the United States and Vietnam. And the idea is not to accept, not to sell, not to give any rhino products to anybody. So with these young people, we are uh, trying to highlight the importance of protecting the rhino for future generations. According to the South African Ministry of Water and Environmental Affairs, 2014 witnessed 1,215 rhinos in the country killed by poachers. The main consumer markets for rhino horns have been Vietnam, China and the United States. I hope that this tour uh, reduces the demand for rhinoceros horn in Southeast Asia. The journey has become a bridge connecting many countries in the world. As scheduled, Ness and Vicky will return to Vietnam in September to continue their project in the country. We've seen some beautiful landscapes on Ha Long Bay and Kappa Island. Traveling down Laos and then we come back into Vietnam. According to environmentalists in Vietnam, coastal provinces have lost thousands of hectares of mangrove forests every year, mainly due to the expansion of shrimp farms. This has in turn tremendously affected the lives of local communities here. Our reporter in Guangnam province brings you more details. In recent years, shrimp farms have encroached upon a vast area of the Chung Zhang River running alongside the coastal commune of Bingzhang in Guangnam province. Hundreds of hectares of mangrove forests grown here have also disappeared. With only two hectares of the forest left, the river is suffering from severe pollution. On the other hand, shrimp farmers have suffered heavy losses due to shrimps contracting diseases. There used to be a large area of mangrove trees here, yet we created the stream farming ponds. We have to eliminate many of these trees. With the local breeding environment being ravaged, the number of natural river animals has also been rapidly reduced. Many local fishermen, like Võ Hùng, have also had to quit their job. Without natural hiding places, the shrimp and fish can no longer live here. I hope the local authorities will soon restore the mangrove forest here. The loss of mangrove forests has also meant that the local coastal dike system is more susceptible to erosion. The land here has also become more infertile due to salinization. More than 300 hectares of planting areas inland are also under threat. If we can restore the mangrove forest, the ecosystem here will be significantly improved. In addition, the forest will also add to the landscape, boosting local tourism. 
In New Thang, another district of Guangnam province, a number of international organizations have launched projects to restore the mangrove forests. Meanwhile, the provincial authorities have also recently approved nearly 700,000 U.S. dollars to restore a mangrove forest in Hoi An City. These cases are seen as positive responses of the public and authorities against the current loss of the mangrove forest. Chen Van Gun was one of the leading painters of modern art in Vietnam. He was the author of many popular works including M Thuy, or Little Sister Thuy, which was recognized as a national treasure. To honor his contribution to Vietnam's art scene, the Vietnam Fine Arts Museum opened an exhibition titled Chen Van Gun and Watercolor Sketches on Friday night in Hanoi. M Thuy, or Little Sister Thuy, is the most famous work of painter Chen Van Gun. Seventy years have passed, and the painting story is still vibrant. This painting depicts a girl, Thuy, when she was nine years old. Gun said that he was impressed with the innocence in her face, but in her eyes we can see some sadness because our country was still at war. That's why the painting is said to bear both aesthetic value and the feeling of our nation at that time. Besides oil paintings, Chen Van Gun also used many other materials, such as lacquer, silk, wood carving, and especially watercolor. His 80 watercolor sketches are being exhibited at the Fine Art Museum on the occasion of his 105th birthday. With images of a female militant or a farmer, the paintings took the public back to the past. We can see in the works of Chen Van Gun very simple and familiar images of daily life. It looks very real. That's what confirms his position as a leader in Vietnam's art scene. Chen Van Gun contributed a large number of works to the country's modern art. This collection has been exhibited for the first time in 1980. And today, after 35 years, the public will have another opportunity to admire and enjoy his work. Should you bring an umbrella tomorrow? Now it's time to have a look at the latest weather updates of selected cities around the world. That's it for our newscast. Simply log on to vtv4.vn or youtube.com slash vtv4go. Goodbye for now and thanks for stopping by.